Welcome to the Nature Journal Connection. I'm your host, John Muir Laws. Today, I'm sitting in the middle of an abandoned salt flat. So a long time ago, there was water all across this area uh, for collecting salts and minerals out of ocean water. But the flats are now dry. And as I walk out here and explore, there are lots of different interesting phenomenon to observe and for me to play with. But the one that's caught my attention the most are these ridges, these mounds. There's a network of these all across this salt flat. And in some places, it's just little bumps, like right over here. But other places, they're making these ridges that sometimes connect with each other. And so my question is, what caused those? And I'm really excited about this question. So uh, sometimes when I get a question, um, I'll just write it down in my journal. Sometimes with a, a could it B question like this, I'll take it the next step. So I'll come up with that, well, it could have been caused by this, this, this. I'll come up with several possible explanations. Today, I'm going to do both those things, but then I'm going to take it even further. And we're going to look at how you can use inference to explore a mystery like this and dig even deeper towards what is going on right now. I cannot directly observe these mounds growing, but I can still learn a lot about this process and what's going on in this environment. Let's take a look. I've now had a chance to explore and I've got several ideas about what could have caused these little ridges. I've also made a number of interesting discoveries. It gives me a better understanding of this strange environment. It turns out that this crust, it's a lot harder than I thought. And when I first came out here, I assumed, I assumed that this was made out of salt, but it's not. This stuff down here by the edge of this waterway, this little kind of snowy looking stuff, that's salt. But there's another mineral up in here, and that's the one that is making this crust. I've also found a few little places where there's evidence of animals. In this, this crack right here, um, when I approached, there was a black-tailed jackrabbit that was nestled down right in this space. And I got fairly close and whoosh, it took off running across the flat. So it was hiding bunk, right down in here. So all these little clues starting putting them together. And what I do is I start to come up with several possible explanations for what could be causing these ridges. And I've written them out in a little chart here. So this is what I call a Y web. And what I do is I write different possible explanations of what could be causing these ridges. So one is animals. So are black-tailed jackrabbits or perhaps you know moles or some other critter creating these uh, creating these ridges by, by burrowing underground or something like that. All right, that's a possibility. One is um, after the water on these flats went down, is this something that's kind of come up from frost heaving? I know I've seen pattern ground and strange frost patterns appearing in Alaska and other really cold places. Other possibilities are that when there was water here and these crystals formed, that there was something in that crystal formation process that caused these little ridges to pop up and appear. Also, I thought of the idea of plates of, a kind of imagining like the, the crust of the earth. There might there are plates of this crust, and if they're moving around where two of them would bang into each other, would that push, would that push the, the, the edges up, making these little ridges? And another idea I had is perhaps, I see a few little patches of plants here, perhaps there is a plant that has stimulated the growth of these things. All of these are possible explanations for what I see. And the official name for a possible explanation like this, these could it be 
statements are hypotheses. So these are hypotheses. And, a, and the idea is you want to come up with more than one. Because if you just come up with one, whatever was the first idea that hit your head, then you will, you will go down that track, you will follow that train as far as you can, and, and you won't be kind of looking broader like, or it could be something else. Right? And so what you want to do is initially come up with a number of possible explanations. And then you also want to, even though you've come up with all the ones, like if you start thinking about it, you're probably going to be able to think of an explanation for what could be causing these ridges that is not on this list. So what I also want to leave room for in my head and in my thinking is, all right, it could be one of these, or it could be something else that I just haven't thought of yet. And so sometimes I'll often draw just another little question mark off on the side here, just to help me kind of remember, right, or something else that I haven't thought of yet. So if you are exploring and you can get this far, um, you have really moved the ball down the field in your thinking about this phenomenon. But if you choose to, you can actually take it deeper. And what you do is you just choose one of these possible explanations. And what you do is you say, like, let's, let's pick this one. For instance, I saw the jackrabbit here, so I'm thinking critters. Let's play with that explanation just a little bit. What I want to do is I want to say, like, if that's true, if these ridges were made by animal action, maybe an animal burrowing underneath the soil, what predictions would I make? What would I expect to see? So, for instance, I might expect to see underground, under some of these ridges, first of all, there's, I expect to see a hollow space. And that hollow space would be sort of shaped by something crawling through. So it wouldn't be uh, rough, loose ground on the bottom. It would be smoothed by a crater move, moving back and forth. And I would expect the surface to be something that an animal moving under the ground could actually move and pick up. I also might expect to see that there are animal droppings. If I pull back some of these little portions, I might expect to look in there and there are little places where I can find animal droppings or even a nest. All of those would be good pieces of evidence supporting this idea that it might be caused by the animals. And I know there are all those other possibilities but you see, what I've done is I've taken an explanation, and out of that, I have gathered a handful of testable predictions. And I can now walk back out here and start looking around and see if I see those things, if I see those predictions. Let's give that a try right now. I've been investigating these little mounds, these ridges, and the holes inside of them. And I'm thinking about that in reference to this hypothesis, this idea, the possible explanation, that these are caused by burrowing mammals. It's possible. Um, but when I, I make predictions, I say to myself, if that's true, then I would expect in some places, just like I would see in a, say, a vole tunnel or a vole runway, there would be poop inside here. There's no poop. Um, if I um, uh, were a critter moving back and forth here, I would expect that there would be uh, kind of a, a flattened place, a rubbed out place where I was moving back and forth. That's not here. It's actually rough, loose ground, very, very soft ground on the bottom that would make easy imprints, but nothing's been pushing it down. Okay? And the, the, the top surface of this is incredibly hard. Whatever mineral is making up this crust, it is, it is uh, trowel bending strong. And it would be very difficult for a critter brewing under the soft soil to push this hard crust up. None of these 
observations are really consistent with the idea that these are caused by mammals. And so I can say that if my assumptions are correct, these tubes are not made by mammals. Oh. When you first start out doing this and you find evidence that's not consistent with whatever idea you were following, at first people tend to be disappointed, like, oh, oh no, my hypothesis that it's these critters um, seems to be wrong. And we kind of associate that wrong with having made a mistake. But that's not the way that it works. You see, what you're doing when you test a hypothesis is you are not going out to try to prove that something is right. You're, going to, you're just walking out there and you're seeing, does the evidence support this or not? Either way, that's a win. Because now I can do a very, very powerful thing. So on this chart, I can say that this um, uh, animal activity hypothesis yeah, probably not. That's probably not what's going on out here. Notice I'm using that tentative language of, of, of science that, that it gives me wiggle room. I'm saying that's probably not that because again, those assumptions. But this is actually really, really power, powerful. I have figured out that these mounds out here are probably not caused by this animal activity. I'm now really kind of liking these kind of crust plates crashing against each other or these crystal formations. Um, and that might be the next avenue that I would explore. And I'd do just exactly the same thing. I would say to myself, if that's true, what would I expect to see? And if I can't come up with any predictions from that, then that hypothesis is not testable at this time. But if I can come up with it like, well, I'd expect to see this, or I'd ex expect to see this and this, I can go out and I can look for those things and that will give me evidence whether that hypothesis is supported by my observations or not. And so I can just start removing possibilities from this list by doing more and more investigations like that. You see, the process itself, when you're getting into inference, it's, it's slow and it's indirect. And you just have to embrace that. You also have to get used to the idea that when you find evidence against your hypothesis, this is a really, really good thing because it's great to be able to say, yeah, probably not that. The more of these that I can cross off, the better. Now, if I cross off just about everybody here, except maybe my, um, my, my crustal plates crashing hypothesis, it doesn't mean that that last hypothesis standing is correct. Um, because remember, it could be something else that you forgot. It's really, really fun to do this. You can go out and you can start to figure this stuff out. Get rid of the language of, um, I am, I've, I've proved that this, all right, we're not about proof here. That's the language of mathematics. Here in science, we're not doing a proof. We're figuring out if the evidence supports this idea or if the evidence doesn't support this idea. And step by step, we're moving closer to an accurate understanding of what's going on out here. You can do this too. And as a matter of fact, that's your challenge for this week. What I would like you to do is to look around and find some phenomenon and come up with some could it be uh, questions. See if you can come up with some could it be questions on, um, you know, for instance, again, how did these ridges form? That's a could it be question. And then these are all my could it be possibilities. Those possibilities in science, we refer to those as our hypotheses, uh, hypotheses, right? So 
come up with your hypotheses. Could it be this? Could it be this? Could it be this? Could it be this? And if any of those you can test either by doing a little experiment, like if I do this, I should see this, or by making a direct observation. All right, I'm going to get in there with my little trowel and see what I see. You'll be able to figure out whether evidence supports that or it doesn't. And you have moved the ball down the field in problem solving in nature. And this idea, more broadly applied, is the way we start to make meaning of the world around us. My confidence in any explanation depends on the strength of the evidence for or against that explanation. And my level of confidence is going to change as new evidence comes to light. So I don't want to get locked into loyalty to any one of these hypotheses. I want to be willing to change my mind as the evidence changes. But I can also provisionally accept an explanation. That is to say, I'm going to hold this as true for now, but I'm willing to change my mind as the evidence changes. Not because I know it's true, I don't, but because this explanation has proven itself through a bunch of my tests and observations to be really predictive, to be really useful. The predictions that I make based on this hypothesis match my observations. So I can give it provisional acceptance and I'm willing to change my mind as the evidence changes. This is the incredibly powerful tool that we can use to get closer and closer, step by step, to a more accurate model of the way that the world works. And until next time, this is your Nature Journal Connection. Do, do, do.